All right. Um, so this is a special episode. Um, this is the first episode that I, Jen, am kind of hosting myself. And we have two amazing guests today um, who work with a firm. Um, so would you all like to introduce yourselves and maybe talk a little bit about the organization? Hey, my name is Esperanza. I am a member of the Transnational Feminist Organization Affirm. Uh, I am a transgender survivor of the sex trade. I am a revolutionary communist, a proletarian feminist, and I am really excited to uh, be here and, you know, speaking with you both. Hell yeah, that's a powerful intro. Yeah, I'm going to sound like dishwater compared to that. <laughs> so my name is Tara Habola Corollis. I am the co-founder of Affirm Hawaii, and I am also uh, the director of the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women, which um, basically makes me deep state sort of ish. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm just glad to hold down this space for um, anti-imperialist feminists uh, in the work that I do. Awesome. Thank you both so much. This gathering today or this podcast today has been in the works for a minute. It kind of started when Comrades in the Red Nation read your piece, Esperanza, talking about expansion of the sex trade and how, um, you know, these very neoliberal ideas about the sex trade are kind of like seeping into radical spaces and even being taken up as radical ideas. And so I'm, I'm the co-founder of the Pueblo Feminist Caucus within the Red Nation. And we realized that um, we absolutely need to have a stance on sex work and the sex trade um, because it hadn't been discussed too much in Red Nation and especially not in the context of revolutionary socialism, which we are. We're revolutionary socialists and we're queer indigenous feminists. And so the Pueblo Feminist Caucus found it necessary to develop this position around the sex trade. And um, it was through organizations like Affirm that we started to think more critically about our politics and um, devote ourselves to studying. I, my question for you all is, um, for people who are interested in developing revolutionary socialist politics around sex work and the sex trade, where, where would you all start? I know we've been talking about Thomas Sankara and his position too. So I just, I wanted to see what, see where you all suggest that people might start. At a firm, I think we start with having a really firm grasp of the history and the creation of patriarchy. So uh, the book of that, uh, that name by Gerda Lerner is a foundational text for us um, to contextualize the work that we're doing in our analysis. So having a really firm stand in that, I'd recommend that book initially, but Esperanza has also been making a lot of recommendations. So yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to build on that, I think that, you know, identifying as a revolutionary socialist also means that, you know, we are scientific socialists, meaning that we take a scientific approach to struggle. And uh, what is that approach? Well, that approach is dialectical and historical materialism. Um, you know, right now, when, when we don't look at uh, phenomena in society from a dialectical and historical materialist perspective, we fall back on understanding things through the lens of the dominant ideology. And what is that dominant ideology? It's liberalism the ideology that was born along with settler colonialism, slavery, genocide, uh, capitalist exploitation, um, and which uh, in the end always justifies those things. And so that's why I think it's so important for us to not look at issues through the lens of idealism, uh, you know, sort of seeing things as disconnected from reality, thinking about what they could be, without looking at what they are and what they have been in order to understand how they'll continue to develop. And so for that reason, I think it's so important that when analyzing this issue, um, especially an issue like this that is so emotionally, politically uh, you know, charged, that we try to locate it uh, in a historical origin point, right? 
and that we trace its development throughout history. And in doing so, uh, we are able to really understand it for what it is and have a clear perspective on it. And so, of course, I would recommend, you know, Gerda Lerner's book, um, of course, Engel's book, uh, where he talks, you know, sort of locates uh, the oppression of women in a historical moment. Uh, Gerda Lerner builds off of his thesis. And, you know, you would also be surprised to uh, find out what different revolutionaries throughout history, such as Sankara, such as, uh, you know, Fanon and others actually had to say about this issue and how they understood it. Certainly. Right. So, I mean, I think in locating that problem historically, um, something that's important for people to remember, especially those of us in the first world, right, like the U.S., North America, is to remember that the introduction of the sex trade of prostitution was the basis of producing capitalism on Turtle Island. And that the sex trade, I know, especially in my region here in New Mexico, has shaped identities. It has shaped even our relationships to land. And uh, it continues to. And, you know, people are familiar with um, the trafficking that takes place around man camps that um, is perpetuated by gas and oil extraction, other mineral extraction that's perpetuated um, by casinos, right? And uh, these other centers of capital. So um, I was just wondering if, if you all wanted to talk a little bit about maybe how this like issue manifests in, in, your, in your particular regions or how you have seen it historically manifest in the, in the places where you are located. It's really obvious that the chain of exploitation from colonization remains unbroken in Hawaii, um, even with empirical data. So, for example, we did a study of, um, an in of interviews with people who had been identified as um, meeting the federal and state criteria for sex trafficking. And um, in that study, the majority were Native Hawaiian, meaning over 60% over actually in that one. And almost half of them had had a mom or a grandmother who had also been um, in the sex trade and so on. So there is evidence of this intergenerational exploitation specifically among Native women in Hawaii. Um, because historically, you know, uh, abduction, trafficking, picture brides um, were practices to meet the demand of, um, you know, this mass migration to erase and replace indigenous people here. And most of those laborers for the plantation here were men. And so it created a need to meet that demand. And traditionally here, and what appears to be continuing from everything that we see um, with service providers and frontliners and survivors is that that's still continuing today. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to to sort of build off of that here in California, um, you know, I, I hope uh, folks have read uh, An Indigenous People's History of the United States um, by Roxanne dunbar Ortiz. And, you know, when, when I was studying that book, I was sort of uh, surprised to come across a breakdown that she does uh, here in Northern California about how uh, prostitution was forcefully introduced. Um, into this land. And, you know, she talks about how, uh, you know, there were, you know, several nations in Northern California um, that experienced, uh, you know, mass death, right, both from armed conflicts with the Spanish, um, as well as from disease, as well as, uh, you know, forceful relocation to missions. And towards the second half of the 19th century, among those same people, U.S. armed forces killed over 4,000, uh, disease killed another 6,000, and up until 1867, um, U.S. settlers kidnapped over 4,000 Native children from those very nations in California. And she writes that the disruption of those Indigenous social structures 
um, along with the dire economic uh, situation that was forced upon them, ended up uh, literally forcing women into prostitution in and around Goldfield camps, which uh, she cites as completely destroying uh, the vestiges of indigenous family life that remained in societies that were largely matriarchal. And so we see how uh, when prostitution, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of inextricably linked with militarism and colonization, and it destroys uh, the values of, you know, uh, sort of indigenous society um, that were lost when it was forced upon them. And, and I think it also says something about the recruitment strategy of the sex trade, which today in what we call the U.S., is completely ignored, right? Because we see it just as an individual choice based on autonomy like any other job. But we're ignoring the fact that since, uh, you know, the sex trade has existed, it has always recruited its army of labor through forced displacement, forced migration, uh, mass murder, uh, abduction, um, and today, what we see is recruiting from those who have been pushed to the edges of society into dire poverty um, through, you know, economic and, and social oppression. Um, and I think it's so important to, you know, be able to trace that from when, uh, you know, this land was forcefully taken up until now and see that there is a common thread in how they recruit their army of labor. Yeah, that that's such a good point that it didn't just the like prostitution as a system didn't arise organically and without tremendous resistance because like in Hawaii, um, and I'm not in the best position to uh, to tell this story, but uh, two two cultural historians and writers, Noilani Arista and Adam Manalo Camp, have written about this, and I would suggest them strongly. You know, the idea that land and women, uh, the idea of of land and women as commodities was shocking and repugnant. And, um, you know, there was this entitlement when male European and then American sailors and soldiers were coming, began coming to the islands, you know, expecting um, access to, to Native women. And when that wasn't granted, you see basically um, insurrection. So in 1825, the chiefs of Hawaii instituted a ban on prostitution because the, what would be the sex trafficking of girls had gotten so out of hand. And um, it, it didn't last because what happened is that the, the sailors attacked the homes and set them on fire of who they thought um, was supporting this ban. So chiefs and also missionaries at that time. And so it was later um, rescinded because they, they were just so incensed that they were visiting and they were not being given access to Native women. Um, and so there was, it was met with violence. Um, so that history is here. It's in other places across the Pacific and around the world that this system did not just, you know, appear because men need sex and it's just a normal feature of human societies. Absolutely. Thank you both for those very eloquent analyses. That was amazing. Um, yeah. And I mean, so I wanted to kind of move into a little bit of myth busting, right? Because, um, you know, like you mentioned, Esperanza, people think that, you know, these are autonomous decisions and um, people, you know, when we put forth these critiques of the sex trade rooted in how they manifested historically, people might accuse us of being like swerfs or whatever, or not supporting sex workers, which is, you know, absolutely ridiculous. and so. You know, when people say things like sex work is work, right? Where, like, where, what is the history of that, of that term, of that famous quote that we see, you know, being shared constantly on infographics? What I'll say on this is that 
you know, you could trace the rise in popularity of the term sex work is work uh, to Carol Lee, who is a sort of neoliberal feminist, but also to some of the first organizations uh, which were founded by pimps, such as Douglas Fox, um, who posed as uh, what they would call themselves sex workers, but they were not. They were actual pimps, right? Um, and who sort of popularized this. And I think that, you know, a realization I was having today is that as somebody who organizes workers, you know, I've specifically organized restaurant workers, we're always fighting the, uh, you know, National Restaurant Association, what we call the other NRA, because as an industry association, their job is to cover up the exploitation in the industry to justify and make excuses for it and to protect and expand the industry. And what I realized is that a lot of the organizations, if not all of them that are pushing this line, uh, you know, that sex work is work, period, there's nothing more to the discussion, act as an industry association that fight to protect and expand the industry at the expense of those who are exploited by it. So, you know, part of what I've tried to popularize with my writing or, or to get across to people is that whether or not something fits a general colloquial definition of work is not important. Uh, plenty of things fit the definition of work. Slave labor fits the definition of work. Child labor fits the definition of work. Um, plenty of things that we could do for money fit the definition of work. But that should not be the litmus test by which we decide whether or not uh, we allow an industry to continue to exist and expand, especially whether or not we want to codify that industry into law. So my sort of response to sex work is work is that, one, uh, it flattens distinctions between uh, prostitution and other forms of wage labor. So, for example, you often hear that, you know, there's no sort of added risk in prostitution. It's just like any other job. Well, if you accept that capitalism is an economic system built off of uh, severe inequality, then you should also accept that industries themselves are going to be, uh, you know, unequal themselves. Some are going to be more dangerous and exploitative than others. Um, it also, you know, ignores the fact that each kind of work comes with a different risk. So if I'm a line cook and I am constantly deep frying French fries, working around a hot stove, hot oil, hot you know pans and plates, there's a high likelihood that I'm going to get burned. Um, if I'm in prostitution, there's a high likelihood that by the very nature of what's happening, I am going to experience rape, sexual assault, beating, robbery. And this is proven true uh, because this violence has never been reformed out at any time throughout history or in any legal context that it's existed in. The second thing I would say about that phrase is that, you know, in attempting to assert a personal agency to withstand that violence, it dismisses the army of labor who make up out of who make up the majority of the sex trade um, and who were actually coerced into it because of social and economic forces. And it sort of justifies that coercion by saying, well, you know, we have to choose any job, right? We all have to make a choice. But the reality is, is that as workers, we have nothing to sell but our labor power, right? We don't have inheritances, assets, etc. But those of us who are blocked from selling our labor power in the formal economy due to racism, transphobia, or just the nature of capitalism requiring a reserve army of unemployed workers, we have to find other ways to survive. And in a society that sexualizes, objectifies, and fetishizes trans women, indigenous women, black women, etc., uh, that is where we are going to be pushed into and be confined within and experience some of the worst uh, and most concentrated forms of male violence. Thank you, Esperanza. Cara, you want to go? 
Well, that was a whole lecture, an amazing lecture on the, on the topic. Right. I mean, I think, you know, Esperance is totally correct in the, the origin story of that term is staunchly white supremacist and it's staunchly neoliberal. Um, I think that people are drawn to it now because, um, you know, a lot of people in the middle or who are just learning about this issue and not really familiar, right? We, we want people to feel valued. We want them to, to feel dignified and we want to respect um, people in our community. Um, but this euphemism goes so much farther than that, right? We could say, why don't we say military work is work, right? Because that stops the whole conversation about critiquing that system. And this phrase has that same function. You know, it's, it's language is, is everything in, in politics and organizing. And this euphemism, similar to like calling torture enhanced interrogation or the War Department, the Department of Defense or legacy, you know, white supremacy and, you know, like legacy programs. So it, it really stops a deeper conversation and it's meant to do that. And so um, it's a great organizing tool um, and it, it really erases, it erases our, our history um, and our experiences. Um, and I remember being in Manila about 10 years ago for, I was living there at the time and I was invited with a number of grassroots feminist um, activist organizations to this ILO um, roundtable at a conference, and they were launching a campaign, Domestic Work is Work. And I remember when a bunch of white uh, European and American um, women's rights activists went on stage in front of the mic with tiny little posters saying Domestic Work is Work. And like all the mouths at the table of <laughs> the Filipinas just dropped because to them, you know, domestic work, um, as the white women were calling it, was the system of exploiting the Philippines for cheap labor and separating our women and, and men from our families over, over decades sometimes, over the entire lifetime of our child. And perpetuating this feudal slave society that was put in place um, by the Spanish colonizers. And so then to have it be promoted and tied to right development money, to grants. Um, I remember being there right when that propaganda was, was coming in. And so it's definitely, it's definitely been incredibly intentional to do that. And I've seen how it's come from the colonizer world and pushed down the throats of recovering nations. Absolutely. You know, I feel like a lot of these bourgeois feminists right here in the U.S., um, you know, people jumping on the OnlyFans train, not because they're doing survival sex work, but because, you know, they think it's, I don't know, an aesthetic they can adopt fail to realize how complicit they actually are in global imperialism and in these ongoing projects of militarization and just like suppression of proletarian women around the world. Um, would y'all like to kind of expand on that? Cause I feel like y'all have already like hit that on the nose for sure. But um, maybe just like in relation to the way people try to justify or normalize um, engaging in the sex trade here in the U.S.? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think there's a few things to be said about that. Um, the first thing is that I, you know, I sometimes I hear people say, like, uh, women objectify themselves on OnlyFans. And, you know, I, I don't believe that any woman can objectify herself because I don't think objectification is an individual um, practice, right? I think it's something that is imposed on us collectively from social and like cultural structures. Um, but, you know, I think that when we look at the rise in OnlyFans, it's actually really instructive of a lot of things that get missed in the dominant discourse on the sex trade. The first is referring back to the recruitment strategy that I mentioned earlier. It's not at all a coincidence that as, you know, the 
crises of COVID-19 and the economic recession uh, hit together, um, it impacted women the hardest. Uh, you know, women lost more jobs than men and had a harder recovery than men. Um, and at that same time, uh, we saw the boom in OnlyFans and other, you know, forms of the sex industry. Um, and I think that that goes to show you that when economic conditions decline, the sex industry is there as a parasitic industry to swoop up the people who have been dispossessed and uh, financially devastated and, um, you know, sort of trap them in that very precarious and uh, violent industry as their only way to survive. Um, and then I would say that, you know, the second thing is look at how mainstream media, such as Business Insider and others, talk about OnlyFans. Um, and, and they talk about it in this sort of uh, you know, vision of meritocracy, right? Like you can uh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and work your way out of poverty. Look at this white woman who was able to buy her house from OnlyFans, you know? And you start to see articles coming out in lesser known publications of women who are like, well, hold on, now the market is saturated and I'm not making any money from this. Or you only make money when you're new and you're the new and hot commodity. And when there's newer girls than you, then you're no longer that hot commodity and you don't make as much money. And so I think it shows that, you know, this, this cultural fantasy that we have about the sex trade uh, is so tied to this American idea of lifting yourself up by the bootstraps. But, but it's a lie. And it's a lie that we're selling, uh, you know, young women, um, women like myself who thought that it was an industry that was going to help me thrive. And in the end, I left, uh, you know, with severe uh, PTSD and sexual trauma. Um, and, and then lastly, just relating it to imperialism is that, you know, in the what we call the United States, we have this very selfish, selfish and chauvinistic attitude where we always see things through the lens of does it benefit me as an individual and ensure my individual advancement in society, my own upward mobility? And so a lot of the analysis is so centered on me, 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 but we don't look at how the sex industry operates globally. We don't look at how this is an industry which not only pulls from uh, the most oppressed groups, from the most oppressed classes, such as proletarian women, trans women, et cetera, but also the most oppressed groups from the most oppressed classes in the most oppressed nations. And we don't look at how it impacts people outside of our own borders. And I think it's so necessary that we do that because when we look at it from an internationalist lens, then our analysis of it and our idea of what is to be done is going to shift dramatically. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Did you want to add, Cara? Well, I think you're you're naming it that imperialism is what is completely missing in the dominant discourse of this issue, because if you look at it through that lens, you cannot say anything but conclude that this is a destructive industry that we need to transition from. Um, I mean, I I've done organizing transnationally um, among Filipinas in areas in South Korea and Japan. And I was in um, South Korea when there was a realignment and they were emptying out uh, the bases throughout metropolitan Seoul into a mega base called Camp Humphreys. And basically the women were migrating with the soldiers. Um, and there was even one time that uh, I was in an art therapy class and one of the women uh, was showing her pictures and for weeks and weeks and weeks all she was drawing was pictures of Uncle Sam or what she thought was Uncle Sam. So pictures of the American flag, um, pictures of being taken to America. <sighs> Prostitution goes hand in hand with imperialism um, and American imperialism specifically right now. And it it just, it, it defines 
it defines women from the colonies. I mean, I think that there's no sensitivity to that. And there's no sensitivity to that, what that means in terms of the, the way that we're, uh, we're impacted on a daily basis. Like, even my mother was assumed to be either a prostitute or a mail order bride because my dad was white and in the military. And I remember growing up and um, being told that by a teacher one time that, you know, fun factoid, uh, Filipina in, in Greek is actually slang for prostitute. So entire nations of women are seen through the lens of this, this industry um, to the world. You know, once you leave U.S. borders and this impacts not just women in the sex trade, but but all women um, from that nation and that people. So uh, I think that it's really incumbent on us to 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 bring this to bring this analysis, especially a conversation around anti-imperialism to the forefront of this conversation. Right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Jesus Christ. So there's so many myths, right, um, that need to be busted about, um, you know, why people do sex work and just is totally ahistorical and completely removed from its context. And so one of the things that I've heard is that um, <laughs> people go as far as um, justifying the expansion of the sex trade by saying things like, well, sex workers um, provide love and they provide, um, you know, this comfort to Johns and people will even try to very disturbingly even frame it in the context of socialism. And, um, like there was this ridiculous take going around Twitter not long ago saying like, um, what if we like thought about sex in terms of mutual aid and sometimes had sex with people we didn't want to in the name of like distributing sex, like, and it, it like there's just these these takes coming out and these like assertions that um you know Johns are victims or that um you know we should we should value them to some extent but like really looking at it from you know revolutionary socialist perspective Johns and pimps are bosses so i was wondering if you all wanted to you know kind of give your responses to to those kinds of takes yeah, so I guess I could sort of take a try at this first. So, you know, what, one of the things that I think is so characteristic of the liberal, you know, discourse around the sex trade is that it obscures uh, class relations and it obscures uh, power relations uh, within the sex trade. So basically, it attempts to paint a neutral picture between uh you know, what you might call the sex worker and the client. And I just to put it out there, I prefer the term prostitute. I myself was a prostitute. When you say sex worker, you could refer to anyone from a dominatrix in a legal dungeon that doesn't have sex, to a cam girl, to a stripper, to a sugar baby, to a prostitute. So I uh, prefer the word prostitute. It, it's not about stigmatizing anyone or making a value judgment. It, it's just for the sake of, you know, accuracy. Um, but but what I found is that, uh, you know, when when you look at capitalism, you you understand it as, uh, you know, relations, a set of relations of power. Right. Um, and capitalism obscures these social relations. Right. Uh, Marx talks about that in Capital. Right. So when when we look at the sex trade, uh, the client always wants uh, to get more from the prostitute for less, whereas the prostitute always wants to do less for more money. The client needs the, uh, you no, know, the prostitute needs the money more than the client needs the sex, right? I experienced this myself. And so this is a uh, power struggle that is, you know, playing out every session. Um, even, you know, one of the, the women who disagreed with my piece, she she said this is the one piece that she agrees with, is that it is a power struggle. Now, the issue is that when this power struggle plays itself out over your body and inside of your body during sex, uh, a violation of your boundaries and sexual violence is bound to happen. And, and that's what makes this so dangerous. Um, and so I, I really think that part of what we need to do 
is go back to a class analysis, is to stop painting everything as a neutral encounter and understand the power relations that are inherent to this. That's, that's so, that's, that's the core of how we need to be thinking about policy, because I think it's really easy to fall victim to, you know, this pull to be compassionate, right? Um, and reduce harm. And the only way to do that is to decriminalize, unionize and regulate um, the sex trade. Um, and then we'll automatically give more power um, and equal footing to um, people in prostitution. When if you have that power analysis that Esperanza is talking about, you know that that will not flip the power dynamic. You will give a little bit of power, um, for example, to um, to approach and utilize the carceral system, for example, um, if you feel safe enough to do that. But you also give total state sanctioning and total protection to the boss, to the buyer um, in that situation. So um, that's why uh, one really good example of that is in Western Australia, even though they've adopted a policy model that is being advocated by um, the sex trade expansionist lobby here is that um, sex has not gotten safer. There is a very low condom use. Um, they've done a number of studies on this. I think they're the only studies I've seen um, that are peer reviewed on this because, right, like the boss, the buyer, uh, you, you still need money and you can still be pressured. Yeah, and therefore, it is still incredibly dangerous. Um, and unsafe. And so some of the things that purportedly um, fully institutionalizing or what they're casting as fully decriminalizing the sex trade will do just don't play out um, based on the the power differential between um, people in prostitution and the boss or the buyer, let alone traffickers and pimps. Absolutely. And one thing I just want to tag on towards the end of this this uh, question is that, you know, the idea that men require sex uh, and that they require sex so much that it becomes socially necessary to recruit an army of labor from the most oppressed classes of women, from the most oppressed nations to service them. That is a fundamentally patriarchal idea. Um, and, and some people might say, well, is this just, you know, moralizing about sex? No, it's not, right? Uh, sex is something that, you know, I have no problem. Uh, do it however many times you want with however many, you know, people you want. But the issue is, is that in our society today, uh, the liberal left does not understand uh, that there are two forces which are currently entrapping and holding our sexualities and bodies hostage. One force that they understand is the state. But one force that they don't understand, and I might pin this to a sort of anarchist liberal tendency, um, is that capitalist market forces uh, also are entrapping our bodies and sexualities. And so if you only free our bodies from the state, uh, but you put it fully into the hands of the capitalist market, um, then you're not liberating anything. And so that's why I really try to go back to this idea that for true sexual liberation to be possible, we have to liberate our bodies and our sexualities from both the state and the market. Dang, yep, that's where it is. That is where it is. Jeez, y'all are just so articulate in all of this, and I'm just, I'm just sitting here as a student learning and taking this in. Thank you so much. So I guess kind of continuing on the question of policy, People obviously seem to, you know, claim to be interested in protection for sex workers, right? Sex workers encompassing the, this very broad spectrum from dominatrixes to strippers to prostituted people. Yet they often can only cite decriminalization as a means of doing that via policy, which y'all just mentioned also would let these Johns and pimps off the hook. And as we can see it in play out in places where it is decriminalized, like in Nordic countries, right, Germany, um, even Australia, 
you know, decriminalization under capitalism just results in just a horrific system. And and we know that people have spoken out um, from places where it exists there. So how would y'all envision the place of policy in liberation for prostituted people and for sex workers altogether? And also, how can this happen while also um, keeping in mind our abolitionist politics and keeping in mind um, you know, the way that carceral feminism can, can sometimes operate and come about? Sorry if that's a loaded question. Well, I want to start where, where all the sides agree, at least on, you know, um, the, the left, um, or the big tent left. You know, we, the status quo can't stand. I mean, it, up until 1990 in Hawaii, it was not even possible for a man to receive any accountability or blame for this system. So prostitution was only a crime for women and gender diverse people who were, um, you know, caught selling. And so that's still really entrenched thinking. And we all, I think, are at a place, though, where we're we're adamant um, in demanding that people in prostitution be decriminalized immediately, like Esperanza was saying. And so that is is where we are in terms of shared space. Um, but after that, it gets ideological. And then some folks think it's just practical, right? That the model that will reduce the most harm for the most people is what we should pursue. And that model is basically deregulation um, or very light regulation um, and letting the, the industry and people in it fight for their rights and it will resolve itself. And then the folks who are saying, like us saying, wait, no, this is not how it actually plays out. Um, and this is not the culture that we want to continue. Basically say that, you know, well, you're just the Nordic model. And saying that abolition of the sex industry is the Nordic model is like saying stewardship of the environment is the Sierra Club. It's a historical and it's racist erasure of indigenous people and indigenous value systems. So um, one, I do think we need to talk about it outside the frame of the Nordic model, because that's just being used as a tool um, to dismiss us um, when it comes to the policy. But I'll pause and hand it over to Esperanza for a second. (laughs) Yeah, 100% to everything that you just said. You know, I think that as revolutionary socialists, right, we can all agree that Uh, There is one class of people that is maintaining this violent, exploitative uh, system, and that is, you know, the ruling capitalist class, right? And their, you know, capitalist state uh, here in, you know, so-called U.S., the settler state, right? Um, And so in order for us to be able to fully address these problems, we have to overthrow uh, that class of people. Um, and we have to take power and make a state in our own image, right? Um, but but the reality is, is that, that that doesn't happen overnight, right? We know, like Kwame Ture said, that uh, as people's consciousness uh, rises and conditions decline, that makes the possibility of, you know, revolution appear. And, and I think, you know, we're seeing that play out, uh, you know, in slowly, uh, but also we're seeing it play out right now before our eyes. Um, But but that doesn't mean that we should reject any reforms that could immediately benefit people, right? Um, There are some reforms that we should pursue as we are building up our forces, as we are building our cadre, as we are building up our consciousness. And I think that a reform that is both possible right now and that would uh, provide material benefit to people is one, uh, decriminalizing the exploited. There is no reason to criminalize someone for doing what they need to do to survive. But two is not decriminalizing the people who are doing the exploiting. I don't believe that police and prisons are going to end sexual violence or end violence against women, right? Uh, But at the same time, uh, that doesn't mean that we should just sort of uh, decriminalize them and let them run loose. So, you know, police haven't been able to stop domestic violence, right? Uh, Oftentimes they make it worse. Does that mean that we should? decriminalize domestic violence? No, of course not, right? 
Um, and so I, I think in a similar way, oftentimes our position is painted as we want to increase the criminalization of certain people. Whereas what we're saying is, no, we want to decriminalize the exploited, but we want to continue holding the people doing the exploiting accountable. And, and, and I think that is a reform that is worth pushing. Another thing is the right to exit. So the founder of our organization, Ninochka Roska, she says, um, the right to exit is the most denied right to women. You see this even with bourgeois women, like the celebrity Kesha, who wasn't even able to exit a contract with a man who raped her. Um, and so if you see it happen, even with these privileged women, imagine how uh, how much worse it is for women who are oppressed and exploited. And, you know, even just recently, we were raising money for a trans woman who was trying to exit the sex trade, uh, but couldn't because she had to pay her rent and she had no other way to pay. I also just had somebody reach out to me who's a woman that was a, you know, former porn actor and is now in the sex trade. And people were calling her a swerf online um, until she came out and was like, no, I'm currently in prostitution and I want to get out. Uh, I've been forced to have anal sex several times, even though that's a hard limit. I've been bleeding because of that, like horrible, horrible things. And she can't leave it because she doesn't have a way out. So I think fighting for the right to exit as a universal right for all people is the most important thing that we could be doing right now. And we know that in countries like New Zealand, where they fully decriminalize pimping and buying, because sex work is like all other work, uh, there's no need to fund exit programs. And so, you know, the, the group that pushed for that law in New Zealand uh, has not pushed for exit programs, has not pushed for services for people. And so what ends up happening is it just further entraps them in a hellish situation that they're not able to escape. So decriminalize the exploited, continue holding the exploiters accountable, and fight for the right to exit as a universal right for all people. Hell yes. Thank you, Esperanza. I remember in a conversation we had prior, um, kind of expanding on this conversation, you had mentioned that the IMF actually pushes countries in the global South to decriminalize for the sake of um, bringing up their quote unquote development statistics. Did you want to talk a little more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just to very briefly touch on this, um, both militarization, uh, imperialist invention, as well intervention, as well as, uh, you know, imperialist fiscal and monetary policies through the World Bank and IMF are directly responsible for pushing women in the third world into prostitution and trapping them in it and have now most recently come out as uh, both encouraging uh, sex tourism by encouraging the tourism industry in general, which they know uh, a non-insignificant majority is uh, made up of the sex industry as well as most recently uh, making comments about uh, decriminalizing the sex trade or institutionalizing it in order to raise their uh, GDP numbers. You know, you see this talked about in a recent uh, discussion or debate between an Argentine feminist and Silvia Federici, right? Um, and so uh, I think that what we see is that when we focus so much on individual autonomy, uh, what we're doing, we, we think that we are destigmatizing women in prostitution, but what we're actually doing is letting uh, these imperialist forces like the IMF and like the World Bank, we're letting them off the hook, right? Um, through their loan policies, through their cuts on social welfare programs, through their globalization, privatization, um, and liberalization agenda, they have you know, pushed large swaths of women into prostitution, you know, and that sort of added on to the women that were pushed into prostitution from the Korean and Vietnam wars, which even, you know, set the infrastructure for the sex tourism industry to develop. Um, and so once again, that's why I think, you know, we as socialists, as revolutionaries, we cannot just look at this issue through an individualist lens, but we have to look at how imperialism and imperialist actors, such as the IMF and the World Bank, have actually pushed women into this, have entrapped them in it, and are now trying to encourage them to maintain the industry 
uh, you know, in, in order to achieve growth, which we know is also not going to happen because that's not how imperialism works. Thank you so much. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Kara? You know, it's worth talking more and unpacking the policy stuff because, you know, there's so many criticisms, right, of, of, of abolition and, and the push to transition out of this destructive industry. And a lot of the time, right, people point to imperfect implementation of these laws or the fact that, you know, patriarchy <laughs> still exists. And it's similar to like pointing to the staggering so-called wealth gap between black and white communities and saying, well, you never should have abolished slavery because, you know, there's all these problems still and nobody's, um, you know, it's not going well. Um, right. We're dealing with a millennia old system and we're trying to also decolonize our homelands. And so, you know, while stuck, um, in occupation. And so how do we, you know, it's unpalatable for many people, you know, to, to even think about harm reduction and engaging the state at all. But like Esperanza was saying, we cannot sanction, there's just certain behavior that would never be accepted in any community under any system. And one of them should be exploiting another person's vulnerability to access their body, period. Um, we need to start seeing that and defining that as exploitation. You know, for us, like th this sympathy that's being pushed for buyers, men of color, um, men of all different economic backgrounds, by sex. But what we know in areas like Minnesota, for example, which has the largest outside of LA urban um, Indian population, that the majority of sex buyers are white middle class men. And we know that they have money because 75% of the white men who are arrested hire private attorneys. That's one little factoid that just goes to show that we're talking about people with power who are racist and who are sexist and who use this as a playground to, you know, harm people and play those play out their ideologies onto women and vulnerable people's bodies. And we cannot sanction that. And so there's a lot of new models that are being proposed to, to try to move away from, you know, policing and, you know, interaction with police um, and, and prison. First of all, if you're a sex buyer, you don't go to prison, you, you know, maybe, maybe jail, but that almost never happens. And one of the things that's being proposed, I think in Seattle has a really good program that is basically about teaching men empathy. And it's over, it's like a year long program um, because it takes at least 25 weeks for the men to just even open up and start being held accountable within their group. And it's led by people who share a similar analysis to us. Um, and it's not going to cure people. It's not going to cure like deeply misogynistic behavior necessarily, but it is a push in the direction towards um, new models. So. There, there is work out there and there are many of us who are absolutely opposed to um, strengthening the carceral approach to this, but we also cannot allow um, to move away from a culture of accountability. Right. I wanted to talk a little more about that. Um, I think when, you know, people, especially those who find themselves engaged in the sex trade themselves, whether they're, whether it's full service or only fans are camming. Um, you know, a lot of times people will say, this is my only choice, right? And um, how can I think about abolishing something that my livelihood is dependent on? And uh, again, in a prior conversation, Esperanza pushed that question and said, well, we need to ask ourselves why it's our only option, right? And so I think this question of, this is how I make my livelihood and it's my only choice, um, prevents us from envisioning a world where the sex trade is abolished. So what are some of y'all's visions moving forward? Um, how can we envision a world where all prostituted people and all sex workers are truly liberated? And um, how can we envision a world without the sex trade? You want to take this one first, Kara? <laughs> sure. Well, it's not that hard to envision that world 
because it existed and it existed relatively recently in certain places like Hawaii. And so as, um, you know, pushing back against this hopelessness of the sex trade expansionist movement is really important because it is a very hopeless movement. It's a movement that just accepts patriarchy and colonization and extreme class hierarchies and, and, and claims that, right, that this is harm reduction for the most privileged is more important than harm elimination for the vast majority of people. And so we have to be um, just constantly in touch and strengthening our own culture and our own values. And then again, just looking to our proud history. That's how I think about that question. Absolutely. And I completely agree with that. You know, I think that there is such a nihilism, a defeatism within, you know, the cultures existing in the imperial core, right? We forget about all of the just amazing, awesome things that were able to be accomplished by, uh, you know, working people and oppressed people joining together. Um, the examples of revolutions in Haiti, in Russia, in China, everywhere um, that were able to once again join together, uh, defeat this imperialist capitalist monster and begin building a society in their own image, right? I think that we need to reclaim that tradition. Um, we need to defeat capitalist realism and how it's infected um, our ability to think and to have hope for our future. I mean, this is this is possible. We don't have to concede struggle, you know? I mean, capitalism has a tendency to commodify everything. Wall Street has recently begun trading on the future of clean and available water. Are we just going to concede struggle and say, well, capitalism commodifies everything. There's nothing we can do. No, we have to fight that. So why are we conceding struggle when it's commodifying our bodies and our sexualities? Well, I think part of that is because our society is patriarchal. We see women, um, femmes, as made for sex. And so there's, you know, as sexual objects. And so it's, it's almost sort of naturalized you know, and, and accepted. Uh, but but I don't think it has to be, right? I think like Kara said, we why are we focusing on harm reduction when we should be in the business of harm elimination, right? Um, we know that this system, the same system that's commodifying our bodies, the same system that's poisoning and commodifying our water is also the system that is uh, potentially, you know, exterminating the human race. And uh, life on earth or species on earth. And and I think that we need to sort of come to the realization that we either fight all of this or we fight none of it, right? And and I'm in for fighting all of it. 